Greetings. It's summer where I'm speaking from. And uh, summer is often thought of as the uh, lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. But from a biblical point of view, summertime uh, is a actually a, a, a sober time in a way. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, in the land of Israel, in the summer. Uh, it, it, let's put it this way. Let's think about California. When I was out in California, I used to tell the people, you know, you, you, you in California appreciate the climate of the, of the land of the Bible because the climate in California is a Mediterranean climate like the climate of the land of Israel. So you, consider your, you can consider yourselves more spiritual than, than the other 49 states. Uh, but in California, for example, you have a rainy season, then you have a dry season. Our family used to once a year make a pilgrimage to the Hollywood Bowl when we lived in Southern California. And we would see a beautiful concert in the evening, an outdoor concert. And you could have an outdoor concert because it wasn't going to rain on you in the summer. And so in California in the summer, it's hot and dry and, and fires right now. It's something to pray about. There's fires going on right now in the northern part of the state, as far as I understand. And so uh, the summer season in the, in the Middle East is a, a dry season and a fiery season. And so it's symbolic of the, of the sober side of, of the history. And it's symbolic of the punishments, unfortunately, that have come upon God's people because of their sins. And actually, midsummer uh, is the time when, in 587 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Holy Temple was destroyed. And then in AD 70, again, Jerusalem was destroyed, and on the same day, the Holy Temple was destroyed. So as Jews around the world were gathering to commemorate the destruction of the first temple, their co-religionists, their brethren, <laughs> kinsmen after the flesh, I think Paul uses that more or less that terminology, were suffering through uh, the second uh, destruction of the temple on this, at the same time. So from that point of view, uh, if you look at Matthew 24, my job as a minister is to in effect feed those who want spiritual food. And you know that certain foods are more appropriate at certain times of the year. There are certain foods that are summer foods, certain foods that are winter foods in those areas where there are seasonal changes. And if you look at Matthew 24 and verse uh, 44, it says, Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at a time, at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over the household to give them food in due season? To give them food in due season. Blessed is, this, is that servant whom the master, when he comes, will find so doing. So I want to give food in due season. So as we come to the summer season, there are certain parts of the Bible that really will have an impact because you'll be reading about them at the time in history when they occurred. So it has a great meaning. Just as you know, when July 4th rolls around in America, we rehearse the events of the uh, Declaration of Independence. We talk about the American Revolution, and it's very meaningful because we're at the very time when the country was born. So here too, there are certain scriptures in the Bible that really have, are impactful when you read them at the very season of the year when, when the events were occurring. So we're in that time of the year now, that the midsummer time, midsummer season. Uh, we've already had the fast of the fourth month. That was, la uh, as I speak, that was uh, this year. Uh, as I'm speaking, it was uh, last Tuesday. And then in three weeks, there'll be the fast of the fifth month. And so it's that season of, of the year, uh, what the uh, Jews call as Bain Himitz, Bain Sarim, between the straits, you know, a, a time of stress. And that discretion comes from the Book of Lamentations. All of you understand who, who are watching this, or even if you don't, I'll just share it with you, that the Old Testament is basically in three parts, the way the Hebrew-speaking world has preserved it. And you could say the New Testament is in four parts, so that you have, in effect, seven parts to the entire Bible, and you could break down the Old Testament from three parts to seven. But another way to, to break it down in parts is to look at in terms of five, and that is an important principle because in the Bible, numbers have a symbolic meaning. The Bible is full, filled with numbers and numerical codes and numerical patterns, and there's, there's a symbol, symbolism to the numbers, and five is symbolic of, of God's love. Think of the English word G-R-A-C-E, grace. 
And so God does, uh, shows his love in multiples of five in the Bible. So you have the five books of the law. And you have, for example, Leviticus 26 and verse 8. I'm going to give you just two examples. I could give you many more, but I'll just go to two. Leviticus 26 and verse 8. And here uh, he says, and this is a blessing that would happen if people were obedient. Five of you, five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall, shall put ten thousand to flight. All of these are multiples of five. And uh, another example is in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 19. I'll just turn there, trying to be useful and helpful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19, he says, uh, Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words, which is a multiple, but 10,000 words in a tongue. Rather than speaking in a language that nobody understands, you know, let's say, let's say that I gave this sermon in Swahili and most of my listeners don't know it. I, right away, I don't know it either, but, you know, I just gave that, I know a few, just a few words, you know, Hakuna Matata, I, you know, whatever. I know some words in Swahili, but I can't speak it. And so if I gave the sermon in Swahili, most of my listeners, will, you know, wouldn't benefit. So Paul says he'd rather give five words where, that people can understand. And again, it's showing love. So you can look at the, uh, at the Bible from the point of view of dividing it up into five parts based upon the five books of the law. And so you have that connected to the seasons of the year. So you have the spring, the time of new beginnings. And this would tie in with Genesis, the, time, the book of beginnings. And it would tie in with the first book of Psalms, which focuses on the human ministry of Jesus Christ, you know, which came to a climax in the spring of the year. And then we have the um, Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, which is uh, basically a honeymoon uh, again, you know, associated with the spring. You know, spring is the time of uh, romance, if you don't mind my, my using that terminology. And then you have the um, first of the five psalms at the end of the book, Psalm 146, which again ties in uh, with the spring. So you have all of this pattern going on. Uh, and then you have the book of Exodus, uh, and particularly beginning with around the 15th chapter, well, the 16th chapter, uh, around that, around there, or the end of the 15th, you're into then the Pentecost season. You're into the time of the giving of the law and the, and the ratification of the covenant. And that ties in with the second book of Psalms, and it ties in with the book of Ruth, where, uh, where, where Ruth uh, comes, comes back, where Naomi and Ruth come back to, to the land of Israel during the harvest season, and Ruth you know, accepts the covenant. She becomes part of the people of Israel, etc. Uh, and so you again have that have that uh, pattern then you have the third uh, book of the Bible Leviticus which focuses on the on the temple and the sacrificial system and also talks about uh, blessings and cursings and uh, that ties in with the uh, third book of Psalms which is something that I would recommend you read there and during this time of the year and uh, then you have you, you'll see that those Psalms tie in with with the book of Leviticus and with the fact that unfortunately God's people over the years as, as a community have really fallen so far short, have become so corrupted that they went through tremendous punishments as a result. You can read about that in, in the third book of Psalms. You can read also the book of Lamentations, uh, which will be read in the synagogues in just, you know, in about less than three weeks. And then you have the book of Numbers where, which, where the focus is on the congregation and administration of the of, of the government of, of God and so that th that is a matter of wisdom so that ties in with the book of Ecclesiastes uh, and it ties in with the fourth book of Psalms which focus on God's kingdom uh, and um, then the also by the way each of these books tie in with a psalm uh, you know so Exodus to with 147 Leviticus with 148 and then and then with uh, 149 is the ties in with the book of Numbers then we have the fifth book of the Bible Deuteronomy and that fifth book, you know, wraps, it, wraps up the package, reviews the events, looks forward to a positive future. And that ties in with the fifth book of Psalms and the final Psalm 150. It also ties in uh, with the book of Esther, uh, which talks about a great victory of God's people. Uh, and so all of that you know, is, is a pattern that one can follow. And that, of course, concludes the, the year. Uh, the book of Esther 
the events that, that, that happened in the book of Esther occurred in the 12th month of the year. It occurred in the winter toward, toward, towards you know, just one month before the Days of Unleavened Bread, one month before the Springs Festival season begins. So it ties, the events tie up together. You finish and then you go on again to the spring. So I hope that that shows you, you know, to some degree, <laughs> I'm skimming the surface here, but there's a tremendous amount of design and themes working through the, the Bible that tie in with the seasons of the year. And uh, as, I, as you know, and as I've said before, and I'll say it now, in the synagogues, there are festival scrolls that are read publicly during those five seasons. As I said, Song of Solomon is read during the Days of Unleavened Bread, Book of Ruth on Pentecost, the Book of Lamentations, on the fast of the fifth month, the book of Ecclesiastes during the festival of tabernacles or the eighth day of sacred assembly, and the book of Esther on the, on the Jewish festival of Purim. So again, there, there's this tremendous tie in there. And this is not something that I'm <laughs> inventing. I mean, I'm just giving you material that I have learned. I'm not doing anything innovative. You know, uh, I've got, I, 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 did, I earned no credit for it. I'm just passing it on. But I, there actually is more to it than that. I actually believe you can take the rest of the Old Testament and divide it up into five parts. And you can actually take the New Testament material and divide it up that way too. So that you really have that theme going through the entire Bible. And I, get, I won't take the time today to do that, but it might be interesting to do it at another time. So I'm calling this talk, that was quite an introduction, a uh, long introduction, but I've, I'm calling this talk Midsummer Psalms. So what I'm recommending is that at this season of the year, when the historical events that you read about, uh, very serious sobering events took place, even at the time of the, of the Exodus, while they were wandering in the wilderness, very sobering events took place at this time of the year. And then later on in history, and then even beyond that, even in later Jewish history, you read about uh, tremendous tragic events that occurred uh, during this season of the year. It's appropriate to read the third book of Psalms at this season. And I want to turn to Psalm 81 because that's a psalm that's very popular in the Jewish community. It's read every Thursday. According to the historical tradition, the Psalm 81 was one that was, there are, there are seven daily psalms. Of course, in your Bible, Psalm 92 is labeled as a, a psalm or song for the Sabbath day. It's there in your Bible. If you have a, a Septuagint version of the Bible, two other psalms are labeled. The Psalm for Wednesday and the Psalm for Friday are labeled. And then there are four other ones. <laughs> the Psalm for the first day of the week and the second day of the week and the third day of the week and then the fifth. You know, they're also labeled in, in well, they're labeled in the Hebrew prayer books. Uh, there, uh, you know, so what I'm tr trying to get across is that Psalm 81 traditionally is, is recited every Thursday, the fifth day of the week. And so it's quite well known among those Jews who, who, would, who are uh, those who attend synagogue or who say their prayers on a regular basis. Now, some of you may have seen the comedy a long time ago, but I suppose movies now, they never really totally fade away because they're out there floating around and people could see them. And there was a movie called The Frisco Kid, uh, where Gene Wilder is a, playing a Polish rabbi who uh, teams up with a, a bank robber, Harrison Ford playing the bank robber. And this bank robber escorts him from uh, all the way to San Francisco, where he, he has to take over a congregation in San Francisco. This is just after the gold rush. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a comedy. But in that comedy, Gene Wilder is visiting with the Amish uh, in Pennsylvania. He had first come to Philadelphia from Poland, and now he's in Amish country. And he's, he's saying his daily prayers, and he finishes up with Psalm 81. Now, you would know that unless you knew the Hebrew, because it's not translated. You just, just hear him chanting the last verse of the psalm. You know, he would have fed them with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. But you don't hear the English, only the Hebrew. So only the in crowd knows <laughs> it's Thursday morning. But you kind of get that idea from following the movie, because he gets on a train, and the next day is Friday afternoon, and he has to get off the train because he doesn't want to ride on the, on, on the Sabbath. So you kind of get the idea, maybe he got on the train later in the week. Turned out he got on the train on a Thursday, if you know the Hebrew. I want to go to Psalm 81 and go through it as I have time. And as I said, I would recommend you go through this third book of Psalms at this time of the year. And if you have any uh, discussion or input or questions, please feel free you know, to, to respond. Uh, let us let us know uh, how you're reacting as you read them, questions that come up or insights that you have. 
Uh, Psalm 81 tells us, Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon. And so the uh, new moons are important. We need, of course, to keep track of the months. And one of the new moons is, in fact, a festival. The seventh, the new moon of the seventh month is an annual festival, the festival of, of trumpets. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon at the full moon on our solemn feast day. So as you know, the full moon is the time the spring festival season, be, you know, the days of unleavened bread begin on the full moon of the spring. The festival of tabernacles uh, begins, that festival begins on the, on the full moon of the seventh month. And it goes on to say, for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob, this he established in Joseph for a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. So, you know, this shows you that the Israelites were indeed in, an, in a state of exile. They were speaking a, a Canaanite dialect. They were in Egypt where ancient Egyptian was being spoken. They were a, a minority group and eventually a captive group. Uh, even if they were, they might not have, technically maybe they were more numerous than the Egyptians, I don't know but uh, they were still oppressed in any case, even if they were numerically superior, which I'm not sure, but uh, they were in any case oppressed. I removed his shoulder from the burden, his hands were freed from the baskets. So as we know, God liberated his people at that time. And that is a type of what Jesus Christ does for sinners, you know, liberating us from the penalty for sin. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you at the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah, so we know God took, took his people to a mountain and there he gave them, you know, with great circumstance, pomp and circumstance, with great uh, signs and wonders, he gave them his law and they ratified his covenant. And then he, uh, they were tested a couple of times of, with, with lack of water and miraculously water was, was, was given to them flowing out of a rock. And there's a lot of symbolism in that. So Maribah has to do with strife. The people contended, you know, we don't have water, we're, we're, we're thirsty, it's the desert. And uh, he came through for them miraculously, giving them water. So it says, Selah, you know, take the time to meditate on this. Take a pause and think about this. At this time, perhaps in ancient times, the music would have crescendoed and people would have quietly listened to the music and thought. That's speculation about the meaning of Selah here. Uh, not my speculation, but, uh, you know, scholarly speculation. Here are my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. There shall be no foreign god among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. The two words are somewhat different, but, you know, some, more or less the same meaning in the Hebrew. And, you know, so we're not to go after just weird, uh, well, of whatever, any alternatives are weird and, and uh irrational because you know there's one God he, he's given us a moral code the rational thing to do is to uh, realize that is to be ethical monotheists that's ra rational if you want a decent world if you want a civilized world the rational way to be is to be an ethical monotheist if you want to if you want to really survive and have a, a really human way of life if you want to have not only not only survive but to have quality of life not to live like like jungle animals you would be ethical monotheists and that's what he is saying here you know this is that you shouldn't be going after other other options i am the eternal your god who brought you out of the land of egypt open your mouth wide and i will fill it now here he's talking about providing for people but on the other hand you know we have there's a tradition among bible students to squeeze as much meaning as we can out of a verse the hebrew term for that is midrash and I was in a, a speech club, and the way we understood this verse was, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. That is to say, get out there and speak and look to God to inspire what you have to say. You know, so hopefully that's what I'm doing from week to week, opening my mouth wide, and hopefully God is filling it. And hopefully you're benefiting from that. And so that's the positive side. That's what he wanted to do. That's the agreement he had made. But unfortunately, that's not what they chose. You know, they chose to, uh, to rebel and to go contrary. And as I said, that is a self-destructive decision. For people not to be ethical, ethical monotheists is self-destructive. But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. Very sad. And that's why this time of the year so many uh, dire consequences occurred. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. People basically rejected the revelation 
I talked last week about the fact that, you know, without revelation, people self-destruct. People are more or less done for. Uh, they, they, or you could, another way to look at it is they, they cast off restraint. They lose discipline without that vision, uh, without uh, direction and, and, and instruction. And, uh, you know, they basically, Israel did that. They rejected this, the instruction, and they went all kinds of other directions, all of them, uh, you know, self-destructive. Now, this is not unique to Israel. If you look in the first chapter of the book of Romans, Paul, writing to the Greco-Roman world of his day, has the same thing to say about them. He said, these are people who had some knowledge of God in earlier centuries, uh, some kind of ethical instruction, and they departed from that and went their own direction and you know all kinds of bizarre ways and and suffered the consequences and you can read about that in Romans 1 so what happened to Israel happened much earlier uh, to, in the Gentile world so the Gentile world you could say maybe has uh, has maybe some excuse because they didn't have Mount Sinai they didn't have that revelation unfortunately the Israelites did so they were really without excuse so he goes on to say you know I'll go back to verse 11 but my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So they gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsel. So, okay, you made your bed, now lie in it. That's in so many words. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. You know, so God is here emoting. This is anthropomorphic kind of language uh, where he's saying, I, you know, if only my people uh, would, uh, you know, would listen to me. And you know from Deuteronomy that thought is there. You know, oh, oh, it's so it's so tragic that Israel won't heed these warnings, that they won't listen to the instruction. You know that they have to learn the hard way. And unfortunately, you know there was a folk song popular in the '60s. Uh, when will they ever learn? <laughs> That's the problem. We never seem to learn. But here's what God says: He says, "If my people would 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 have responded, if my people would have responded, if they had listened, if they had obeyed." I would have been so happy to then have blessed them. Uh, I would, he said in verse 14, I would soon, sub, soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. So Israel is, is, was put in a position not isolated from the human race. They were put in a position uh, in the Mediterranean, the center of the world. That's what it means, Mediterranean, where Europe, Asia, and Africa come together. They were put in a position to influence other nations, to be an example. But on the other hand, when you're in a position like that, you're very vulnerable. Israel is in a very strategic location, and so it's very vulnerable. So either, if you're in Israel, you're either going to be a power or you're going to be a doormat, one or the other, because you're in a very important location. So Israel has to be powerful or Israel becomes a doormat. Uh, right now, Israel is, frankly, a major power in its region of the world, and that's ne by necessity. Uh, well, anyway... Uh, he says that God says here, I would have subdued your enemies if you had been responsive to me. But that's not, of course, what happened. Israel was conquered again and again. Uh, and uh, as you know, they went for uh, 1,800 years and more with, even without a, 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 a political entity there in the, in the land of Israel. They went all those centuries without, without a nation of their own. Uh, verse 15, the haters of the eternal would pretend submission to him but their time would endure forever. So uh, th this is a, maybe a, a passage that could be taken more than one way, but what it's saying is that, you know, God would have blessed his people so much that others who really don't like them and are hostile would at least have to have the fa facade uh, of, of being friendly, you know, because of the fear of what would happen otherwise. But he says, nevertheless, they would, their destiny it would be an eternal destiny. In other words, they would always be uh, ha having to submit. As long as they remain hostile to, to Israel, they would <laughs> you know, not be the winners. They would be the losers until they came around to right attitude. Then they wouldn't be losers anymore. They'd be winners along with Israel. But as long as they, ha they have that hostility to Israel, they would continue to you know, be perpetual losers. And now focusing back on his own people, he says he would have fed them also with the finest of wheat, and, and that's the verse I read earlier in the Hebrew or said out loud in the Hebrew. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock I would have satisfied you. So here uh, God is saying that he wants only the best for us. We're the ones who in effect uh, bring on 
uh, negative uh, results because of the way we live, because of the way people around us are living. We have just a general environment where there's just too much of a negative behavior, and it tends to affect everybody, you know, and he wants only the best for us. And uh, this phrase you find in verse 16, <coughs> pardon me, back in Deuteronomy, in the 32nd chapter, in the 13th verse, as they're about to enter the promised land, the promised land is described, um, and it, it, uh, it, it says he made them ride in the heights of the earth. This is Deuteronomy 32, 13. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he made them ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of that that he might eat the produce of the fields he made him draw rock from the honey and oil from the flinty rock so israel does have the land of israel does have rocky places but in those rocky places there are there are honeycombs you know and honey can in effect trips out of the rocks <coughs> and olive trees grow on these hilly areas and from rocky areas you have olive trees growing so you can get in effect honey out of the rock and uh, olive oil, uh, you know, out of the rock. But it's also symbolic. We understand that in this very chapter, uh, and, and uh, um, I believe we have that kind of terminology, and all through the Bible, you know, we have that terminology that really God is called the rock of Israel, Sur Yisrael, and uh, he's, he's symbolized as a rock. And so, in effect, he's saying that, you know, from, from divine providence, from the source of all that is good, you would be getting honey, the sweetness, you, you know, sustenance, you'd be getting oil, you'd be getting energy, and, and oil is also symbolic of God's spirit. Honey is symbolic of his word that guides and directs us and gives us a good life, and oil is symbolic of not only prosperity, but also symbolic of God's spirit. And of course, these come through having a right relationship to God through Jesus Christ, who is the rock. I want to just go through 1 Corinthians 10, just, you know, I'll briefly... Uh, well, I don't know how briefly it's going to be. I'm going to turn there however long it takes me, right? You don't have to time it. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. Uh, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. If you ever went to the synagogue on Sabbath afternoon, you'd be singing a beautiful song, Sur Michel uh, you know, uh, from the rock, uh, the, the rock from... Uh, from, from which we, 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 we ate. You know, it's a beautiful uh, poem that is sung on Sabbath afternoon. And so Paul was aware of that tradition in his day. And he talked about the rock that followed them and that rock uh, was uh, Christ. So I wanna go back to Psalm 81 and now go back to verse 16. And as the, as the Psalm concludes, he would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. So he would have blessed our ancestors if they had only obeyed, and he will bless us if we obey. It, it, you know, it's a continual relationship. Our ancestors should have had it, and now we have the opportunity to develop it if we, have, if we don't have it. And just remember that God does want only the best for us. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians 6 to conclude. What does he ultimately want? He wants us to be family, literally. He wants us to be sons and daughters. He wants us to have an eternal relationship with him and with one another. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, uh, I will be a father to you, 2 Corinthians 6, 18, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So he wants only the best for us, and unfortunately, uh, our ancestors went the other direction and suffered uh, accordingly. Uh, but we have the opportunity to turn that around individually, and someday we'll have the opportunity to turn down that around nationally. So as I said, these Psalms are very helpful, at this, particularly at this season of the year, this third book of Psalms. So let me give you that as a kind of homework assignment. Uh, you know, obviously I can't make you do it. I can't sneak into your home and force you to do it. But I would recommend that at this season of the year that you read Psalm 73 to Psalm 89. And as I said, if you have any insights or questions, you can share them uh, with, with us here. In the meantime, all the best to you and yours.